So with that said, I want to dive in this morning, a lot to uh, cover. Um, choo, there we go. Here's what we're going to look at. How do we respond in times of spiritual and political uncertainty? How do we respond? And then we're going to let King Hezekiah kind of show us the way. But I have three words that we're going to look at this morning, um, and Hezekiah is going to help us kind of wrestle with these words, and one of these I've made up. So uh, the first one is sanctify, unify, and then gospelify. <laughs> and um, I kind of like that word. I, if you have a word that is, should fit there, help me out. But um, I kind of like it. So, um, and I'll just des describe what I mean from that. But Hezekiah helps us in times of uncertainty as we're going to see just what was happening in Israel as we can look at today. Um, these are three things. First one is sanctify. There's a, actually a connection with simplify in there um, that we're going to look at. But I just want to raise our hope as we get into this this morning on the idea of sanctify. Folks, the power of the gospel um, is so that you would be, I would be, we would be sanctified. Not just later when Jesus returns, but now. Sadly, most of us have grown up in an environment where the gospel, the end of the line, is that our sins are forgiven. And what I want to sink in, we're going to come back to this, is that's the beginning. That's not the end. We're forgiven so we can be holy. This is the whole course of what God did in the, in, in the Old Testament was um, most people would say, why, why did he get, uh, the, is, uh, you know, save the Israelites out of Egypt? Many would say, well, it's to get them to, especially our Western mentality, to get them to the Holy Land, the Promised Land. In our framework, moving into this context, hey, we're forgiven to get us to heaven. That's not it. If you look at it, the reason why he wanted to get them, the primary reason was the tabernacle. He wanted a people to dwell with him, holy like he is holy. How can a, a, a sinful people exist in fellowship with a holy God? And it's the same today. As, and, and I want to raise the level of, of folks, whatever you're dealing with, and, and today in the church, we need to recover the priority of holiness. He saved you to be holy like him. And that's not just some other place there. His church is to be this shining light of showing the power of the gospel to radically deliver and to transform us into Christ's likeness. We are to be set apart from the world. And we've had enough of decades of church in America all being relevant, all being more like the world than like God. And we are reaping the consequence of that today. Paul, we all through the Bible, right? We, whether it's in Romans or whether it's in Galatians, right? The promise is if we walk by the Spirit, we will not carry out the deeds of the flesh. That's a promise that we're to lay hold of. And so I want to raise, no matter what you're dealing with, no matter what struggle you're dealing with, whether it's a mental issue, whether it's an addiction, just go down the list of things. What I want to say is the gospel is more than enough. We don't need plus on this. We don't need to, and this is what I mean by gospel fi right? Is we need to apply and recover the power of the gospel today. It has been watered down. We, as Americans in the church, we've added a thousand programs, a thousand steps, a thousand other things that you need rather than the power of the gospel. Paul was overwhelmed. He said, it, I'm not ashamed of it. It's the power of God to save. That means he'll deliver, set free. It's more than adequate. It's more than enough. More than enough. And this is what has to be recovered by faith in the church, right? And to get there, the other word is unified, right? Is under, if the church is not unified, we will not be able to stand when, the, uh, when it comes to the attack from the inside as well as from the attack from the outside. And we'll see, again, Hezekiah is going to show us the way <clears throat> along this, this route. And then just gospel five, right, is... The radical nature of the gospel, right? You are forgiven. Forgiveness is the beginning. We're forgiven so we're set right before God so we can walk in holiness, so that we can walk and live in this whole new life by the Spirit of God. And this is what the king, the gospel of the kingdom is all about. Not just this more therapeutic gospel that we have kind of held on to today. And uh, so we're going to let Hezekiah show us the way um, this morning. Um, okay, so 
I want to just, as we get into this, chapter 17, I'm going to lay some background before we get into 18 with Hezekiah. In chapter 17 of 2 Kings, what's happened is the northern kingdom um, has come to the point where it's so syncretized with the, all the other uh, religions um, around the world. They've so lost their devotion to God um, that um, there's no one left, right? Basically holding up the banner of, of God's word and his commands. And at some point, as we've seen all through the kings, is that God, something radical happens, right? He comes. You can't continue to reject him. No nation, nothing, even Israel, who's our example, without God getting involved on a political level. And so here's something just I need you to hold on to when it comes to looking at prophecy, looking at how God's moved through history, how he's going to move in the end. And when there is syncretism, when there's when the church, when God's people start becoming more like the world around them, is that that is a sure sign, right, that God is about to do something. And um, what happened in the northern kingdom, chapter 17, is Assyria comes in, takes the northern kingdom completely captive to Assyria, takes them into exile. And God had warned them, warned them, warned them, right? Been gracious and gracious over time, but you had corrupt king after corrupt king and a corruption of, the, of God's people. And that was creeping down into Judah, right? The southern kingdom, <clears throat> where they were also being tempted, right, to take hold of the Baals and all the other uh, religions. But, but here's the principle, folks, is that, and, and the New Testament supports this, I'm going to just show us a couple verses this morning, is that when the church starts looking more like the world, not set apart to holiness in God's command, is God's about to do something. And we see that this is what actually Jesus, Paul, all the New Testament says, and it's kind of shocking, but this is real important to understand, is that when the church, not when the world goes crazy, but when the church starts doing the same as the world on a large scale is get ready. The end is coming. So you don't have to turn there, <clears throat> but I'm just going to give you a couple verses to uh, kind of show you what we're talking about. This is 1 Timothy chapter 4. <clears throat> First couple verses. Now the Spirit, this is Paul, he says, now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits, teachings of demons, um, through the insanity of liars whose consciousness are seared. The Spirit says, in the end, when things start really happening, you can look in the church. And when people, right, start moving away from the gospel, when they start up bringing in the things, the philosophies, the psychology of the world, and other things rather than the gospel, it starts blending these together. Pay attention to what is happening. And when that starts happening at more of a rapid rate, right, be careful, be watchful. And then to 2 Timothy, <clears throat> chapter 3. But understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self. Now just listen to this. Paul is defining what the last days will look like. And what I need you to understand is this is not just out there. What he's defining here is what is happening and what the church will look like. In the last days... <clears throat> Will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to parents. And that whole, in the Greek there, means there will be friction in the family. <clears throat> Ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Now, I just, just, I just want to throw this out. The American church. Is there any indication today that the majority of Christians in America love God and his church more than pleasure? more than their agenda, more than our agenda, more than what we want. 
In other words, Paul's saying the last days, watch, be watchful. That you're not swept away by something we're not even aware of. But look, he goes even deeper than this. Having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Now, we could spend a whole series just on that line alone. Having an appearance of godliness, having the appearance of being Christians, having the appearance of having a healthy church, but denying its power. In other words, bouncing out to put our faith in other things rather than trusting in the power of God to deliver us. In other words, bouncing out to trust in some other thing. Technology, what? Just throw it out there. Whatever is man's way, the world's way, rather than the power of the gospel to do what God promises it will do. And then he just raises the issue. Where's the faith? Right within God's people. And then chapter four, I won't read it, but he goes on and just warns Timothy, says, preach the word. In these times, stand, preach the word, because time will come where people will have ears, right? They're not for solid teaching anymore. The, the time will come in the end where people will find their own teachers. They're going to find teachers that tickle their ears, right? To find teaching that fits into, makes them feel comfortable, makes them feel happy, right? Fits into their desiring pleasures and comfort over God, okay? I don't know if it could be any clearer, but I think... Folks, I just need us to hold on to thinking about that when we look at what's going on around us because it's happening quick, right? And, and the issue is what's happening in the church. Where's the desire for holiness? Where's the desire to please God above everything else, right? Uh, this is where we have to lock arms and unify so we can stand strong and, and have God come and restore. And so let's go back and, and uh, that's the context. Chapter 17, right, in... Um, in 2 Kings, that leads into Hezekiah, the northern kingdom's gone because of this. The southern kingdom now, um, God has a, a dispensation of grace, shall we say. He raises up this unique king, Hezekiah. And he calls him, we're going to just see these three areas um, this morning, and three lessons again. Um, about, wow, how do we respond in times of, of great uncertainty, of, of just all these big questions? And, and my, my heartfelt challenge and encouragement to you is don't be numbed by, by what's going on, right? There is that we have to be watchful. This is why the Word of God has given this to us in our own soul and locking arms, being walking with each other. And we'll, I'll talk about some practical things um, along those lines as we dive in. Here we go. Lesson, we're up to lesson 25 in this series. And um, I hope that you followed along. And these will, again, be sent out to, uh, in tomorrow morning if you uh, want to uh, wait for that, for those notes. In times of spiritual and political uncertainty, we are to simplify and sanctify our hearts and our lives so that the church can faithfully represent the kingdom of God. Okay. Chapter 18, 2 Kings, Hezekiah. In the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abi, and the daughter of, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord according to all that David his father had done. He removed the high places, broke down the pillars, cut down the Asherah, and he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the people of Israel, the northern kingdom, had made offerings to it. It was called the Neshutan. Um, so what's going on here? What sets Hezekiah apart here is other kings have tore down the high places. If you've been in this series, we talked a lot about the high places. It's where people went to worship. And they had high places set up for all the different gods. And the kings had, uh, in some righteous kings had tried to tear these down, but they just kept rising up again um, and being built again. But what was unique about Hezekiah is that, and we'll see this in just a minute, is that not only did he tear down the, the Baals and all the false idols and everything, the high places, but he also tore down the high places that were set up to worship God, the one true God, Yahweh, that God's people would go up and, and heal as well. But the he calls them back to unity as we're going to see Hezekiah restores the temple and temple worship, the simplicity of obedience to what God, how God called his people to worship. 
And uh, also we see that, remember the story in Numbers where the uh, wrath had broken on the people of God in the desert and God called Moses to put a serpent up on, raise on a stick and he held it as the people looked to, to that, they were saved, right, from their snake bites. Well, isn't this just human nature, right? Is that we take a physical thing and over time we put more, right, allegiance to that physical thing than we do the spiritual reality of trusting in God. That's just the whole history of the church, right? Is that people are more enamored by the things, by the building, by the songs, right? By the cathedral or the liturgy or the creeds or man's traditions in religion rather than God himself, right? That is just the course, right, throughout history that typically our flesh goes towards. And so he tears all that down. Simplicity, he's moving, the uni- he's trying to unify God's people again to stand strong, right, and again, um, be obedient to God and his commands. He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him, for he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but he kept the commands that the Lord God um, um, had given him. And the Lord was with him wherever he went, and he prospered. Um, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria. So a lot of politics is going on here. Uh, at this time, his father had made an alliance with uh, Assyria for, for uh, obviously for safety. And that required them to pay tribute. And when you paid tribute, you also had to give tribute to their gods. There was this interwovenness between politics and the religion. And so Hezekiah cleaned that up. Right, So he went to unify the people around worship. He cut that off with Assyria. He made some strong, uh, a strong stance when it came to um, sanctifying. And if you could go to 2 Chronicles um, uh, 29 through 31, that's just this other part, um, more details into the story. And it talks about how he called the Levites back to uh, the temple and he restored the temple. The temple at this time had, had idols in it and it, there was no more sacrifice. I mean, the whole religion, God's commands had just fallen apart over the years. And uh, Isaiah brings them back to bring sanctity, right, to God's house. Huh? Hezekiah, thank you, sorry. And, uh, and folks, what does that mean for us today? on this idea of sanctity. So, um, a couple things. Uh, I'd say this, when we look at politics, is there's this intimate connection. When there's syncretism, we see among God's people, when God's people start not being called out and separate and start blending in with the surrounding culture, is there is always upheaval in politics. And so there's a spiritual connection between God's people and their obedience versus what's happening in the political realm. And remember, it's not politics that drive things. God knows who's in these places. It is God, it is the spiritual realm that is influencing the politics. And uh, so what we should be doing, have a filter that goes first from a a spiritual avenue, right, should influence, and a biblical truth should influence our politics in the sense that God is always communicating. He promises to communicate through his people what he's doing ahead of time. It's always promised. And we see it all through old and new time. He will always communicate to his people who are faithfully following him what he's going to do, what he's going to carry out right throughout the world and in nations. And so in the midst of uncertainty, in the midst of political uncertainty, in the midst of, of this time that Hezekiah finds himself, the first thing he does is he calls his people to sanctify themselves, to cleanse themselves. And that begins with a simplicity. In fact, I just know in our own lives, in, our, in my own life, it's just a, it's a rule of life that we need to sometimes simplify life, cut out, clean out the clutter, right, from the house, but this house especially, so we can focus on, wow, Lord, speak to me, restore me back to my, my call and what you've called me to, which is to be set apart, holy, to be conformed to the image of your son, um, and so I, I just throw that out, folks, to us that this has to be restored today, this idea of holiness. You don't hear, and we've gone through decades now where um, we have just, uh, I saw the other day that old bumper sticker, some of you are old enough to remember this bump, bumper sticker that, that was popular <clears throat> 
couple decades ago now, but it speaks to the, the, how the uh, psychology, if you want to say, has crept in, in the church. But the bumper sticker went something along the lines of, um, uh, uh, what is it? You know the bumper sticker, right? Forgiven. Uh, I just blanked on it. Um, Way to go, matey. Yeah. Yeah, we're not perfect. Christians aren't perfect. They're just forgiven. What's wrong with that? There's something radically wrong with that. And that is exactly how, right, we, we have, a God called you to be separate. He called you to be holy. He called you to live like Jesus. The church and those who follow Jesus is, are, are, are to look different to love differently by the power of the Spirit of God. And because I'm forgiven, because I'm made righteous graciously by Him, my natural response is to please Him, right, and to walk in in holiness. And that bumper sticker, that was just one of the things of the age. And we could go on all, you know, in this modern thing of, hey, it's okay, and I'm sure you guys heard this before, right? It's, it's, uh, It's okay to not be okay. There's, no. No, it's not. That's why Jesus came. And so all these little slogans, folks, that creep into the church, they corrupt the power of the gospel that is more than sufficient. And God's people need to rise up with faith and take hold of it again, especially in times like this, to be called to be separate. And we spend more time in the church walking this on coddling sin, coddling behavior that's not pleasing to God out of a sense, ah, we don't want to be judgmental. Ah, I don't want to say that in radical contradiction to exactly what God commands his people, how to love one another in the truth. And that our great love for each other is to push one another on to holiness, to lean into the power of God that's more than sufficient to handle anything I'm dealing with. And again, folks, I, I, if we, I could just go stat after stat, right? We have been in decades of making excuses for why somebody's not changing. Making excuses for why I can't change. All that is, folks, I'm just going to be as bold as I can, is a lack of faith among God's people, according to what God clearly has commanded and what he said. The gospel is sufficient. And in times of uncertainty, man, we have got to come back to a reckoning with each other of, do I believe it? If I believe I'm forgiven, then all the resources I need, right? The promises, everything we need for life and godliness, he's given us. That's a promise of scripture, right? And um, otherwise we drift. We drift with culture more than we'd ever realize. And so what is, what is and I could go on and on. I, I just say, read the context of look what Hezekiah does. Restores the priesthood, restores the temple, restores worship, restores the simplicity, the unity of what God's people are all about, of being a people in the presence of God, to worship God, expecting great things from God, right, to be poured out, okay? Sanctify. And part of that is just going to be simplifying. So really for the last couple of years, the elders um, here, we've, we've been just sitting back Wanting to jump in, and my tendency is I'm terrible at sitting and listening. Um, I just, Lord, just tell me what to do. I'll do it, right? But that's not how God works, is that he, he tests us, and um, he wants to know, do we really want to hear from him? And oftentimes, it requires in life two long periods of time of, of just waiting on the Lord. Lord, you break in, and the temptation's always to bounce out, right? To do something, Right? And so I just say that we've been waiting on the Lord and, um, and I think this, this idea of simplicity has overwhelmed us in many ways rather than going and adopting a whole bunch of programs or doing anything is we are entering as a church into an era of simplicity. We want to do two things really well that God commands us. One, you'll be hearing about in September, Derek will be rolling this out, but just um, kind of this very uh, much simpler uh, way of doing groups, getting people involved together um, so they can wrestle with what does it mean to be a mature follower of Christ? What does spiritual maturity look like? And we have seven things in spiritual formation just to encourage each other, pray for each other, minister to each other, be the church for each other. All right, to simplify, we're not adopting any programs. 
This is all real. We're going to use some great resources, some great tools. But we're doing that and we're doing discipleship, the command that God's given us. Men on men, women on women, making disciples that make disciples. And we'll be rolling that out in, um, in October with a resource and inviting people into this journey of what that looks like. Um, simplicity and with a heartbeat for, Lord, sanctify us. Let us be unified as a church on we want to be like you, Jesus. We don't want to just give lip service. We don't want to hold or create a godliness that uh, looks good, but there is, we're not holding on or seeing the evidence of the power in changed, transformed lives, right? And to come and simplify and target towards that. And, and I'll, I'll speak a little bit more on that here in the next couple points. Lesson 26 in times of spiritual, political uncertainty, it is critical the church unifies around the biblical imperatives of God's word so it can stand in the midst of attacks from within and from without. And um, so we move in this story, Hezekiah, um, he, he does all this and then you have Sennacherib, we have the, the new king of Assyria come down and I love the later part of, and I don't have time, just give it to you to go read um, the details of God's word but he sends forth these three guys um, from uh, Assyria, the Tartan, the Rabshakeh and the Rabseris. I mean, those sound like some pretty bad dudes. Um, <laughs> and I wouldn't want those guys after me but... Uh, and they come to Jerusalem. And so just now, that he, you know, they've unified, they've restored the temple, they've taken down the high places, they've called themselves, he's called the people to cleanse themselves, again, to commit themselves to God and, and to be God's people. And here comes the attack. And these three guys come with this horde of this army and they start just lobbing in. I mean, it is just, they're taunting and they're taunting the living God. And this is where they say, hey, I mean, they say no God is able to stand up against the Assyrians. And it's just this taunting and this taunting, right, that's going on. And, and they, uh, I, uh, Hezekiah sends out his envoy to try to talk to them. But they don't want to talk to them. They want to, they're shouting at the people on the wall. They're trying to instill fear. What are they trying to do? They're trying to disunify God's people and trying to put fear upon God's people and they're saying, don't trust in God. Your God can't do anything. He hasn't done anything for you. Is the Assyrians have crushed every God that we've come a, a, upon. I mean, you just read it. It's, it's, it's pretty harsh. And it would instill the fear upon anybody, right, in, in uh, the context. And then I just want to point out one thing. In verse 31, um, this is an uh, uh, interesting verse is they actually go and they take this promise. And um, this is really interesting. It says in uh, verse 31, then each, they, they say, hey, make peace with us and come out to us. And if you do, then each one of you will eat of his own vine, each one his own fig tree, and each one of you will drink the water his own cistern. Now, where's that from? There's about five different places in the Old Testament where you can read that line. And that is... Um, first used to define the peace and prosperity that the people experienced under Solomon. The greatest ex expression of prosperity and, um, that the Israelites had ever, in the Old Testament, ever experienced. And these enemies come in and they use this to just cut through the core, right? To lie to them, to try to deceive them. Now here's a really interesting point. Does anybody um, ever, does that verse sound familiar to you if you're a historian you know that many of our founders of this country used that verse right there to define what they wanted to see happen in America you can hear it from several of them all through the founding of this nation this was the line right that we all would eat from our own vine each one of us our own fig tree a promise of prosperity right that if God's people are true to his commands and stay, God will bring a blessing. Um, and so we see this attack, right, from the outside, even to the very bringing back the past, the, the golden ages of the good life is, no, you'll have that, you, Hezekiah's not gonna give that to you. Don't trust in, in your God, right? And so in our country today too, it would be some sense of the, of the subtle message of trust in the American dream, 
And the sad thing is, folks, if you chart from the beginning of our country, that verse and the promise of what the American dream was originally supposed to be compared to what people see it now, there's been a radical, radical change in what that is, right? And what the promise is. So, what about unify? Is that the church has to unify. If Hezekiah had not unified, called the people to cleanse themselves and unify themselves, is, man, what was, the attack is coming, and that attack is trying, it's from the outside, but it's also from the inside, as we saw from the New Testament, right? False teacher. Jesus says in the end, it's mainly gonna be from the inside. There'll be those who go out from us and that they will teach a false gospel. They will blend in more with the world and they will bring great Uh, disunity, great frustration to the church to disunify the church, to water down the gospel and the promises of God. And so when it comes to um, this idea of unity um, in this time of uncertainty, um, I think also as elders, leaders of the church praying into this, right, this Lord, help us unify, help us strengthen around um, what you've called us to. So some just simple things, um, but we will be heading in the beginning of September um, we're going to move out of this series and we're going to move into the book of Ephesians. And as a church, we're going to be in Ephesians all year long. I'll screw you along. Ephesians is a special book, right? It is kind of the book that is this holistic picture of a healthy church. And this is what should be going on here. Um, the ladies' study on Wednesday is going to be in the book of Ephesians. We're going to have a ladies' study in the evening in the book of Ephesians. Our men on, uh, at Forge, Mid Valley, um, as well as here, will be in Ephesians. We're going to unify around this book and ask God to strengthen us. We just ask you to come join us, to join us in one of those places, and, uh, and let's see what God does right in this time to bring a sense of, of unity because without unity, without, again, leadership and the people and all uh, the families, without a sense of locking arms is, you know what, you, the enemy has a heyday. And we see this all through, right, scripture. And Hezekiah knew this. And there's an intimate connection between cleansing, being right before God, a cleansing and accountability to God, and also a sense of unity and how those things radically are to fit together. Last thing. Lesson 27, in times of spiritual and political uncertainty, the church body must regain its faith and trust in the power of the gospel of the kingdom to save, to heal, to transform, and make sure it's not compromised with worldly options and opinions. To gospelify, take that gospel. Do we believe it? Is it our first course of trust Do we understand the magnitude of what God has done for us? Um, So just real quick here, uh, we move on into chapter 19. And uh, so here comes Assyria. Here comes this mighty army um, against Hezekiah and this tiny little Judah. God's unified, they're cleansed, they're unified, trusting in God. And we see, starting in chapter, or verse 15 of chapter 19, Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned above the cherim, you are the God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Now, O Lord, our God, save us. Please, and again, folks, that word in the Old and the New Testament, it is not just having our sins forgiven. It is delivering you from anything that oppresses you. It is the power to bring the fruit of the Spirit in your life to set your mind and your soul free. It is to deliver you from anything that hangs you up. And Hezekiah is laying, oh God, you are our deliverer. You are our healer. Save us, please, from his hand. Because this is an impossible situation that he's finding himself in. That all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, O Lord, you are God alone. And if you read the rest of the story, you know the mighty deliverance that God brought to his people, right? 185 of the Syrians were slain. The angel of the Lord got involved. God took up the battle of the people because of a unity among the king and the people and laying hold, right, of God's truth and, and faith, right, in his promise, leaning into him, 
right? Leaning into, right, this gospel that goes all the way back to the Old Testament, right, that God will save. He is the one who redeems. He will ultimately bring the Redeemer, right, his son to complete, right, this, this work. So um, let me move on to chapter 20. In chapter 20, what we see here is that um, God deli- has this amazing deliverance. Goes, it's, it's a testimony to all the nations of, wow, God is with Israel. Um, and it says, in these days, Hezekiah became sick and was at the point of death. And Isaiah, the prophet, son of Amos, came to him and said to him, thus says the Lord, set your house in order for you shall die. You shall not recover. Oh, that's a prophecy you don't want to hear. Um, and so what does Hezekiah do? Now, this is so important, folks. So important. That is a true word of God to, uh, from Isaiah. This is the prophet Isaiah who wrote the book of Isaiah to the king, right? And, and you know, it'd be like, oh, you know. But what does Hezekiah do? He does it again. We see his heart here. But he immediately says, then Hezekiah turned his face to the wall, prayed to the Lord saying, now, O Lord, please remember how I've walked before you in faithfulness and a whole heart and done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. He mourned before the Lord. And, before, and listen to this. And before Isaiah had gone out of the middle of the court, the word of the Lord came to him. Turn back. And say to Hezekiah, the leader of my people, thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer. I've seen your tears, the truth of your heart, the emotions, the motive of your heart, right? Behold, I will heal you. Folks, I, I, I just want to point out in, is that God, he might give, right, a command through a prophet. He might have the worst, you know, we might get the worst diagnosis, whatever it is. God is a God who hears the prayers of his people and his church and will move and even change course to being healing. Do you believe that? Is that kind of faith even alive in the church of God today in America? As we talked about a couple weeks ago, I gave five clear things, right, to call us. Do I really believe God is my great physician or is my faith in the medical community? And don't misunderstand me. And I always get kicked back on this. And let me tell you, that's just proof that we have an idol. We're in trouble. It's just proof. Look, medicine's a blessing. It's a blessing from God. Of course we use it. But is God my first course? Is he the one I trust in? Is he the one that I talk to first? Right? Um, and, and do I bring him to the diagnosis? Do I call upon him to heal me? Or do I lean more into technology, whatever it may be? Where's my faith? Ultimately, the motives of my heart. Have I gone to bitter weeping before God that he would break into others I know? Have I interceded with tears showing my heart broken for people that God would move? And folks, God tests us. We're gonna see it here in a minute um, to see where our faith is. And so... um, the rest of this story, just go, I don't have time to, uh, to break it all down. There's so much here. But uh, um, he heals him. Um, and then Isaiah wants to, or uh, um, he promises him 15 years, more of a life. And Hezekiah wants to know, okay, uh, show that to me, God. And this is the story where with Isaiah, and he, and he says, and God moves the shadow back. Right, moves the shadow back. Forward's easy with the sun. Backwards is a miracle, right? Now, here's a little piece. This, I want to give you a little lesson why it's so important to get into the Bible and to be a student of the Bible and to dig in deep, okay? Because in chapter 20, the, the other, um, in 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verse 31, gives us incredible insight into the last part of Hezekiah's life is he has this incredible healing. God's promised 15 more years. And um, God's blessed the nation Judah, protected them in the midst of supernatural protection. And now an envoy comes from the distant new kingdom rising, Babylon, to Hezekiah. And in Kings, it just reads, they come and he shows them his whole story. It shows them all of his treasure. And Isaiah comes to him and says, what, where did these people come from? What did you show them? He says, because you did that, is that your kingdom is going to be wiped out, but not until after you're dead. And you're like, what? Well, what's so wrong with that? Well, if you don't go to 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verse 31, listen to this. And so, 
in the matter of the envoys, of the Babylonian envoys, the princes of Babylon, who had been sent to him to inquire about the sign that had been done in the land. God left him to himself in order to test him to know all that was in his heart. Whoa. It wasn't just the Babylon, they weren't, the envoy from Babylon hadn't come because in the Kings it says because they'd heard he was sick. The real reason they came was they'd heard a mighty miracle was done in your life. And when the Babylonians came to Hezekiah and Hezekiah, what did he do? He did not give credit to God. He did not say, let me tell you the glory of the one and only God who healed me, moved his shadow back and radically saved me, gave me 15 extra years. What did he do? Hey guys, come on in. I'm glad you're here. Let me show you how great my kingdom is. Let me show you the massive treasure that, and the favor. Because if you go back and read it, Hezekiah is that he was lavished because of his faithfulness. Lavished treasures. Lavish upon his kingdom. It's like, guys, come on in here. Check this out. And it says here in 2 Chronicles, don't miss it. It says that God left him alone to test the depth of his heart. Wow. And so, folks, I just end with that when it comes to this idea of the gospel of the kingdom, right? Is man, this idea of sanctification, this idea of being right before God, it's tough work. We need each other. We need to press in on this issue and, uh, and encourage each other. It's hard. It is hard. Every one of us struggles to bounce out, right? And, and it's hard to trust God. It's hard to have faith. As we talked about a couple weeks ago, we got to fight for this stuff. Faith is a fight, and it's by faith that we, we lay hold of these, these promises and we, and we watch them. And God, he allows us to go through things to test our faith. He wants to know. Now, he knows it. So why does he allow us to go through this? Because we have to learn. It's how faith is strengthened. It's how in each of our lives it's proven what's in here. Is there really right faith for God? In the depth of my heart, is there really something going on? And folks, this is why the simplifying aspect we want to do here is we want to get each other, circle up, let's dive deep on this issue, right? To push each other on, right? For what does it look like to mature in Christ? Let's help each other. Let's pray for each other. Let's lock arms. We need each other, right, in this journey. Discipleship, what does it mean really to follow Jesus? Let's lock arms. How do we do this, right, with each other? Because it's so easy that we have created a, a Christian culture today but with podcasts, a thousand resources, everything, that you can gain all kinds of head knowledge, years and years you can go through the Christian life and deep inside your soul really never develop faith. And I want that to sink in. You can listen to podcasts, you can go to conferences, you can go to seminary. You can pack your head full of theological information. You can be in church for decades and everything. And inside the core of your soul, never really grow your faith. Your faith. Trusting in the Lord. Have a heart for Him. A mind that is, is, is renewed in His Word, is led by the Spirit of God. Right, and, and is growing, enlarging, right, with the glory of the power of the gospel and the love of God. Um, that's why we need to encourage one another, especially as we see times moving of uncertainty, right, in this life. So, with that said, I'm going to leave all that with you. Um, is folks, um, we've been pressing in in a season of just of just prayer is that we expect God to do great things. And uh, one, if those guys would come on up, um, is they're just going to bless us this morning. Um, but I'd ask you to just take this time and, uh, and go before the Lord. I know amongst us all, I've shared some of my own just battles fighting for things with the Lord and with others and seeing God break through. But first, we've got to fight for this stuff. And we have to raise, come together and raise our level of faith and trust in the word of God. And it begins with just coming and kind of having a simplified house cleaning. Lord, come on, wake me up. Am I trusting in you? Do I believe in the glory of your gospel to heal and everything that word means? And so I just want to call us into just a time right now. It could be that you need healing. You need emotional, physical healing of some kind. Lean into the Lord. 
And if you're here this morning, you want prayer, Mr. others to come circle around, man, we're always here just as a body to love on each other and serve each other. It could be that you are burdened. Where are the tears of God's people to intercede to see other people set free, healed, delivered, uh, to experience the love of God right inside their soul? Um, let's, let's press in right before the Lord. So, Father, we love you. And, um, Lord, we stand upon this, this wonderful thing, Lord, that you said to Hezekiah that you've heard our prayer, you've seen the tears, and you will heal. God, that's your heart. You're a healer, God. You want to bless your people. Those who call you say, drawn to me, I'll draw unto you. See me, you'll find me. Lord, restore this among your people. And Holy Spirit, right now, just move among your people, Lord. Lord, I, I, I've heard the testimonies. I know you're at war. Come in a powerful way, Lord, this morning. Let's just experience you, God. Mm-hmm.